<laughs> what did you say on screen? <laughs> kank, kank, kank. You know, you know the P the P two P render. <laughs> You've been rendered with entertainment. Hey guys, everybody, welcome back to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Uh, brought to you every Wednesday at 8 p.m., Mike Manley, to your video scope. Well, hello. By pain and suffering. <laughs> By men and. <laughs> By the, uh, hunch, the hunchbacks. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, you guys. Um, my name is Jamar Nicholas. Um, cartoon is a good standing. Uh, I uh, have a series of Scholastic Graphics called Leon the Extraordinary. Look for the first book in August 2022, which is right around the corner, Mike. I'm very excited. As you well know, young man. <laughs> and you can pre order that book. Everywhere the books are sold, young person. So you have no excuse. Go cop it. Uh, uh, I'm going to cut out all of my nicknames tonight just to uh, introduce. Uh, always stuck by the proverbial hip is my best bud and master chief of cartoons, Michael Manley. Say hi, Mike. Hey, everybody. Oh, man. Oh, hello, JRD. Mike, you know what? This is one of my favorite times of the month. If if you're um, a pencilier in good standing and you see how we do things around here, you know that we do around three or four uh, interviews. Or we'll have a guest on, and then we kind of go back to basics, basic training, Mike Manley, for, you ready? Boot camp! <laughs> you know, everybody loves, everybody loves boot camp. Boot camp! I think maybe some people are scared of the name. Oh, really? Yeah, maybe some people are scared of boot camp because, I mean, you know, <laughs> then you put that picture of like some sergeant yelling at some, <laughs> some, some, you know, some plea, you know? I mean, that's like, but I thought cartooning was supposed to be fun. No, nah, bro. Boot camp. <laughs> You know, you got uh, gunnery, gunnery, uh, master sergeant, uh, early Ermy. That's you right. You know, uh, you know, hitting somebody in the throat or punching somebody in the stomach. Two chops, bro. Um, but yeah, you know what? Maybe you might be onto something, Mike. Um, I wonder if there are uh, people who watch the show who are who are afraid of boot camp. What's up, D. Brad? On our pencil, is good standing. D. D. Brad says he's ready for the boot. He's ready for it, bro. Actually, it's it's all it's all love. There's no there's no pain. There's no pain involved in boot camp. No, but JR- unlike the real, unlike the real boot camp, which is mm-hmm. nothing but pain. JRD goes against popular opinion, Mike Manley. He says, Mike, you might be onto something. JRD, would you like to expound on that? Do you think people are afraid of boot camp? Or even better, Mike, let's talk about the real elephant in the room critiques right or uh when you know, when we first started doing the uh video version of pencil to pencil we were doing a really cool thing we were giving the opportunity for uh viewers to send in pages right, right? and uh we could we would live crit and uh, uh talk about people's work and that lasted for a couple of months. And then it just kind of like people stopped sending stuff in. <laughs> do, you, do you have an idea why the phenomena happens, Michael? Why? I, uh, you know, I think most people prefer praise. You know, but, you know, and a lot of wannabe young, you know, up and coming cartoonists say they want to crit. But, you know, it's hard to take a critique. Yeah. Um, when you work on something, um, and you know, I've heard stories of like famous critiques, like Alex Toth giving the critique to Steve Rude, you know, and it was not very nice or very kind. Um, but I always looked at the critique as a way for the more experienced artist to give me information to make my work better but i think when people hear critique they think critical that means you don't like me you know it has all the it has a real negative connotation to it but uh when i went back to art school i loved the critique because that was a time for me to have 
one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. And I would actually, my favorite teachers, I would always stay after class and we would continue the discussion. Um, I would always try to get him to come to my studio and look at what I was painting if I didn't have the, couldn't bring the work to class. But I noticed that a lot of the, I would say, you know, easily three quarters of the young, younger artists would be like dreading the critique and then would light out right after class was over, over you know? And it's like, mm. I think maybe because I never had a teacher when I was younger. Right. Yeah. I didn't have a teacher to teach me how to do cartooning. I had to teach myself. So the only time I would be lucky enough to have any kind of a critique would be to the couple of comic shows I might be able to go to a year. Sometimes it was one, you know, sometimes maybe it was two. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there would even be an artist that I was not, let's say, a huge fan of. But that person would be at the show. And, you know, I would trod there and, you know, take my portfolio and go up and show it to him because how else am I going to get feedback? You know, like um, mm -hmm. I know Brett talked about on the podcast how he for several years actually had a correspondence back and forth between himself and Al Milgram. And Al Milgram used to be an editor at Marvel, which eventually led to Brett getting getting work. Um and I think now in this modern age, there's so many ways to get information and to talk to people. I, I could never imagine that when I was younger that I would be able to basically have everybody's Facebook, right? If you can think about just about every artist you think of has an Instagram, a Facebook, or Twitter. And if you send them something, Mm -hmm. 99 times out of 100, at least with the male artists, they will respond to you. You know, <laughs> they, they will, there was, and I know that Jamar and I have been talking about trying to have more female artists on the show. And it's actually hard to get in contact with a lot of female artists because they basically like, don't, don't send me a private message. Don't email me. Uh, and they usually don't respond if you send, even if you send something through their regular email. Yeah. And I think because of the toxicity of, of, of the downside of all this connectivity is the toxicity. Mm -hmm. But to go back to my original point, you know, it was very hard to find a critique. Right. So I am a big believer in critiques because of the way I would always say to my students, it's a way for me to go, okay, this is what you're trying to do. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not successful. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you do these little things, it will actually become more successful. Or you're like, you're going in one direction completely blind to something else, right? Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you're, you go like, oh, I find this one thing that you, very often is this thing you will drop you're juggling four balls, but you're going to drop one. Mm -hmm. You know, you concentrate on one thing so hard that you miss the perspective of seeing something else. So I look at, at a critique as a completely positive thing, even if it means that you have to completely start over from scratch, because at least, you know, OK, now I know why that other thing wasn't working that other version that other drawing the problem i was having and then i can you know i can move forward uh jrd says generations younger than ours are not conditioned to handle true critique it's taken as a personal attack rather than a list of potential improvements oh well, that's what i was yeah this is basically what i was saying and mm -hmm. so i try to address that in the very beginning of the class and the fact is if you are a professional, people critique your work all the time. And very often, not in a very nice way. Right. And it's like, no, this sucks. I need it better. Go make it better. <laughs> right. They don't tell you how to make it better. They just go, it sucks. Right. You got to press the but the better button. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've all had that experience. You know, you're working with a client who can't tell you what they want. They can only tell you what they don't want until they see what they want. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And some people, you know, are not, they're just not nice. They don't have a, the, the, they're not nice in their criticisms or their way of, of working with their team. And so you have to basically, you have to toughen up because the real world is just, can just be brutal. Well, you know what, to that point, and I always like talking about this because this is usually a, a, a place on, on the podcast where uh, uh, the veil of magic is lifted and then the hard work is shown right um where uh, we both teach and i know especially teaching high school kids or like college freshmen and art school and things like that they have a very kind of like personal uh, uh relationship with critiques right you know it's like okay put everybody put their work on the board and they all they all start yeah they all there's always a reaction. Somebody will run out the room, like the Naruto run out the room, or they're like, oh no. Somebody drops to their knees screaming. It's very dramatic. And usually you'll hear things like, he hates me, or what, you know, all of this. And it's just a very kind of like, I don't know. It's, but yeah, it's not even an immature thing. It's just like a very skewed way of looking at, you know, it's time to show your work. Right. Uh, So I always find that really interesting. And I always try to do my best to just say, like, look, you know, everybody has a turn. And I don't know, Mike, if you've dealt with this a lot with young classes where you have to kind of pull something out of the students for them to actually say anything about the other students work. But then they expect the sun and the moon when it's their turn. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, part of the thing with the way it's supposed to work right (laughs) Right. is the colleges want you as a teacher to have everybody hang up their work and then we go over and everybody chips throws their chip you know at the wall and then we all learn from that experience Mm -hmm. that works only in theory because in reality most people are afraid to hang their work up Mm -hmm. most people don't want to talk Right. Because they're all afraid of saying something embarrassing or critiquing somebody else. And then they're like, oh, yeah, well, wait till I get to your work. Right. I'm going to roast you when it's when it's your turn. Yeah. Right. And so I found, especially if you have a large class. I I just would go through and critique everybody's stuff. People were, were able to chip in. I would always ask if anybody has have anything to add because you had to move along. Right. right. Yeah. Or else you could sitting there for 45 minutes and nobody wants to say anything. You got to be like, well, do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to say? And it's, it's really, it's not a professional situation. Now they're students, but you're trying to be a student to become a professional. Right. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. n- most of the students I was teaching, especially in animation, you know, are going to try to learn this stuff so they can go work at, you know, Disney or Cartoon Network or wherever they want to work. Um, and when you work in animation, it is a team effort and you are expected to contribute not only your artwork, but you're expected to contribute your opinion if you feel that something can be improved. So if they go around the table and everybody's saying something and then they come to you and you're like, eh. <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> pro or con, then the other people on the team are going to kind of feel like, hey, you know, like what's right. up with Joe over there? They're not really, mm-hmm. you know, they're not they're not being a good egg on the on the part of the team, you know. Right. right. Um, and in comics, you're alone, sitting in your studio. Most cartoonists work alone. Some, mm-hmm. like me, from time to time, have visitors or have assistance, but most cartoonists, you know, there's mm-hmm. a few studios here or there, you know, like the guy Gene studio, or like I used to work with Al and, and Brad, or I used to have people work over here. Um, but very often you're alone by yourself working for a very long period of time and you really don't get any feedback on your work. You know, right, right. Um, I would say that I, I get feedback on this phantom strip, from my writer, the writer uh, Tony, 
and we have a good rapport, but I would say 99.9 times out of 100, I never hear anything from King Features ever about mm -hmm. anything that mm -hmm. I hear. And the mm -hmm. only time I hear from them is like, hey, are the strips coming today? You're late. Right. Where's, where's the stuff? Right. Never, you never get like an email back like, wow, okay. I can see why you were late this week. Really looks good. Man, never. You, you drew a horse riding a riding a bicycle. Exactly. <laughs> Shooting a machine gun. Yeah. That's you right. know, yeah, yeah. So um um yeah. So I mean you just have to you have to grow up, you have to toughen up, you have to mature. Critiques as an artist are a part of life. If you're working in a commercial industry, you are there to serve the client. You're there to serve the purpose of the of the project. And if you cannot take criticism, you know, constructive criticism, you're not going to be really cut out to do this. And I know people who are not, so they sort of become fine artists because then your work, your client is yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you can also be a fine artist. And have a gallery owner going like, well, I really like those last paintings you did because right. they really sold. But these new paintings, I can't really sell those new paintings. So mm -hmm. how about, you know, maybe doing some of those ones like you did before? Huh. How dare you? You know, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, uh, I really like the green paintings. Can't you do more green paintings? <laughs> it's, I mean, I mean, that's that's what happens, you know. Yeah. If you're selling art, people want to buy stuff they like. If you're running in a gallery, your whole point is to have paintings hanging that sell. So it's it's kind of the it's kind of the same the same thing. But uh, yeah. Um, so okay, before we get started, I I still have our sponsors up on the screen. You see the John above my head. That's right, the John. You see that John right there. This John is saying that our good buddies at Graphicsly. Uh, are one of our sponsors who <laughs> create Clip Studio Paint. Yeah, that's right, that Clip Studio Paint. And also our best bud, John Morrow, who is a publisher at Two Morrows Publishing, the, the, the publisher of Mike Manley's fine periodical Draw! Exclamation Point magazine. Mike, are there any uh, physical copies of Draw! left? Do you know? Very few. I know John is having another sale. Mm -hmm. So we're getting down to the bottom. Actually, on a lot of the magazines, a lot of the, um, in fact, I put up a link on my Facebook page. I think it was earlier in the week. Uh, they're really down to the bottom on a lot of the Modern Masters, a lot of the, the back issues on a, on, a, on a lot of the Tomorrow's product. And, you know, there will always be available digital. Many of them like draw, but some of them, once they're, once they're gone, they're going so yeah so. <laughs> going going so well then you'll be paying collectors prices oh no um so but yeah thanks and please um check out our sponsors let me take them off the screen uh michael manley you know we're doing boot camp tonight and we we sold a lot of wolf tickets last week uh, after our very uh, special guest Ashley A. Woods, uh, right? The dog uh, enjoyed. He that. said, "He said yes, wolf, <laughs> wolf, 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 wolf." Tickets um, uh, exited early. Uh, we had a great time talking to Ashley, and we said, "Well, boot camp's coming up," and I started to talk about that at the beginning of the show. That we kind of try to stay on a schedule of three to four interviews then we do a boot camp, kind of as we used to. If you are a fan of the early pencil to pencil podcasts we would do uh, a palate cleanser. Remember that, Mike? Man? Oh, right, yeah. The palate cleanser was, you know, all right, let's kind of break up the, the the interview kind of schism and do something else. Before it was Mike, Brett, and myself talking or maybe showing artwork. But the tutorial thing started to catch on. People were really interested, Mike, in you drawing and kind of going through some uh, cartooning problems on the screen and interacting with the with the viewers. So tonight we're going to do a variant of that. You want to kind of explain what we're going to do tonight? Well, uh, last week when we were talking to people, we sort of came up with the inking uh, as a tutorial and then uh, doing digital versus traditional. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, that would be a good thing. Um, and so we'll start out, I think, doing the traditional 
and then we will go and do the digital. Um, and so I will start, um, I have a drawing of the Hulk um, that I'll start doing uh, traditionally. And then mm-hmm. once that's done, I'll hop over and do it uh, digitally. Um, because I think one of the things about the craft of cartooning, which has really changed, is a lot of people are really working digitally now. A lot of people are inking. Uh, a lot of comics, were more, you know, mainstream stuff is is hopped over to doing um, to doing digital. Um, that's there's a lot of pros and cons to that from from my perspective. The main con is that you don't have an original to sell, and I like having an actual physical piece of art. Mm-hmm. Um, and number two, um, I think there's a certain element that has to deal with craftsmanship. And so, of course, I worked the majority of my career traditionally, and there was no digital tools really to be able to do it uh in any uh effective way like there are now um but my skill set my line my craftsmanship my muscle memory that i employ doing digital all comes from my traditional skills and one of the things that's very interesting to me like you i use clip studio all the time I enjoy it. And they have like 9 million brushes that you can buy. <laughs> right. And they almost all feel, well, they all feel the same because I'm working on a glass tablet and I'm not working with the feedback of the pen or the brush against an actual surface of rag paper. Um, and so I'm having to craft my line to make it look like what my line would look like traditionally traditionally and it doesn't happen automatically and so even today even though i do the phantom i pencil it traditionally but ink it digitally due to the pandemic and the fact liang my assistant is not coming over to the studio um i would much prefer to ink it traditionally Mm -hmm. um and there's for a variety of reasons. One is I pref- just like the feedback of a pen, a real pen on paper and using a Hunt 108 or a Hunt 102 or using, you know, a large variety of pen point um, cannot be replicated by clip, mm-hmm. right? And it's a great program, but there's just a lot of stuff I can do traditionally that's not going to come out digitally part of it also too is when you're doing stuff traditionally there are accidents or unplanned things you know like when you take a dry brush you do a dry brush technique or a splatter technique or you use a pen and the pen hits something it kind of skips or whatever Mm -hmm. that's not a planned thing and the technical the 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 digital stuff always gives you exactly the same feeling except for your pressure right you can make it fatter or you can make it thinner but it's never going to catch on the paper it's never going to pull on the paper it's never going to tug on the paper uh the dry brush is always going to be exactly the same so there's a lot of technique that i learned and i perfected and i practiced from the very beginning, and in fact, if John uh, Jamar, if you want to bring up, um, I sent Jamar. I found some old sketchbooks uh, that that basically had um, these are practice sheets. So this probably goes back to the early '80s, um, and I started this, doing these as a as a teenager. So there's many sketchbooks and you know pa- pieces of paper like this that are completely lost. But what I would do is I would. Um, <laughs> That's so small. Hold on. No. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll, I'll fix it. Uh, what I would do is I would practice inking with a brush or a pen. Um, and I would try to emulate various 
artists that I was a fan of. And mm -hmm. on this one here, you can probably, I don't know, can you zoom in a little bit? Uh, it's its just going to get blurry. The super tiny mic. Huh. Does I say yeah. I don't know why I got. I don't know. Let's try another one. <laughs> Can't win them all. Let's try that. Okay. Well, don't worry about it. Can you turn it off? The, the main point was uh, I would practice copying artwork from comic books because I didn't have any original art and I would practice let's say I like Joe Kubert or I like Al Williamson or Wally Wood or whoever I was admiring and I would try to figure out through reading an interview or whatever they would say oh this person used a brush or this person used this kind of a pen point so I would go to the art store and I you know I would buy a number four sable brush or I would buy uh, the various pen points that I would read about. And I would literally do what I showed there is I would copy, copy, trying to make brush strokes like Al or like Wood or like Hubert or like Sinnott, you know, or Giordano, right? Mm -hmm. And like, well, why did when Tom Palmer inked Neil Adams, it looked different than when Neil Adams inked Neil Adams, and it looked different than when Dick Giordano inked Neil Adams, right? And then you come to realize, well, some people are using one kind of pen, some people are using another kind of pen, some people are using a brush. Like Giordano was a very brush, uh, a brush guy, but he could make his brush look like a pen because he had this way of taking the brush and cutting it. So it would have a slight angle to it, so it would give it this straighter angled feel, not a, a totally round feel, right? So mm -hmm. as I got into the craftsmanship and, you know, let's say you liked um, Hank Ketchum mm -hmm. or you like Charles Schultz, right? You like the line of how that, or Walt Kelly, or Jeff McNelly, you know, there was all these artists that I love and I would try to figure out, okay, what, what, how are they doing it? How are they making, how are they inking? You know, are you inking a line away from you? Or are you inking a line towards you? Are you with a pen, you pull it mm -hmm. with a brush, you can pull it or you can flick it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I would literally spend, I don't know, by the time I was 13, and I remember the first time I tried to ink something. My grandfather, we talked about before on the show, was a display letterer. Mm -hmm. So he used to do lettering like back before Photoshop and all this stuff. Everything was done by hand. So he had all these different pen points. And some of them were weird, and I couldn't figure out, like, well, how do you, you know, but he had these smaller pen points. And so I remember inking, trying to ink with with those. They were lettering pen points, so they weren't really good for, like, fine cross hatching. But I remember trying, okay, here's a bottle of ink, and then you have to figure out, like, well, do you can't go this way because that doesn't tear the paper. Okay, you pull the line, you know, mm -hmm, and then you, mm -hmm. you figure out how to make a smooth line to make uh, uh again you start i always say it's sort of like martial arts you learn your katas when you do martial arts you move you learn your movements right you move these little movements and then you learn bigger movements and it becomes muscle memory and art especially inking is really like a muscle memory you can sit there and practice until you get a, comfortable making a very smooth line with your with your tool and then eventually everyone figures out okay i like this kind of a pen and i like this kind of a brush or some people like my buddy ricardo villagran who's a fantastic inker one of the best ever he's all brush Mm -hmm. He inks 99.9% .9 of everything with a brush, right? Mm -hmm. So did Ruff He. A lot of people, all brush, or Nestor Redondo, a lot of the great Filipino. Yeah. 
right? Alfredo Alcala, people like that. These amazing stuff looked like Franklin Booth, but it was all brush where Booth did stuff with a pen. So um, I even found another old sketchbook I figured I'd show. Yeah, I'll um, give you the screen. Wow, that's that's super old, Michael. So sometimes, again, I would imitate somebody. I don't know if you can see this. So there's, uh, I think I was <laughs> copying Jose Munoz kind of a thing. Nice. Right? So I would, I would come across an artist I'd like, and then I would sort of practice with a pen or a brush. Now, this stuff is later mm -hmm. than the, um, the stuff we were showing you before. Um, and uh, so I would literally sit there and sometimes raw draw with a pen. Like, uh, here's something interesting. So here's uh, some studies I did of... Um, yeah, that, that's good. Mm -hmm. Of Frank Thorne. Mm. And... I tried to figure out, well, what kind of pen is he using? Yeah. And I think I sort of figured out he was sort of using like a, almost like a globe point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd sit there and try to ink stuff, copy stuff, ink stuff to figure out. Like if I liked something that somebody did, I would copy it to try to figure out how that person uh, did it. And so, again, a sketchbook is really vital Uh for doing that and here's another example of a of a comic that i did in my sketchbook and i think mm -hmm. I, you know, I was looking at munoz um who was a big influence on people like keith giffen and yeah stuff like that well so i would i would be doing this and i think this i tried to do so that i was not i didn't do any pencils first i was just trying to like do it just, just just get just get it in there yeah just draw with a pen right because i'd heard like some of these guys would just draw with a pen mm -hmm. and they wouldn't they wouldn't do um so i do i would do a lot of things like just practice no pencils right just drawing with a pen right freehand drawing with a pen and mm -hmm. that's probably the best way to learn how to use a pen Right now, I'm not mm. talking about a Copic or a, <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about a marker. Are and you mar are you marker shaming, Mike? <laughs> uh, no, because a lot of the guys I liked, like Toth and Gil Kane and people like that, they used markers. Mm -hmm. Right? They 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 used markers. I'm trying to I had some other stuff bookmarked here. Okay, so here's another. And so sometimes I would sit there, and so here's another practice piece. Well, how 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 old is that, Mike? It looks really, really this crisp. is probably around 1984. Wow, somewhere in there, I that's, was probably about 24. That's maybe, that's 23, fan, 24. That's fantastic. So I would sit there and just like freehand. This is all brush. Mm -hmm right and i would sit there and then loosely pencil something and then try to draw force myself to learn how to draw with the pen or the brush in this case sort of but like kim jong ji does mm -hmm. except i was nowhere good as near as good as as uh as uh, <laughs> as, as uh as he was um I have another one here. Well, Mike is talking about sketchbooks. So if anybody has any questions, there's another. Oh, that's really tight, man. I like that. And that's all brush too. That's all. That's all brush. Hmm. I love it. And that's all brush. Um. So I was always trying to figure out, you know, how people were doing stuff again this is like the early 80s so it was not so easy it was easier because by then you had more 
interview magazines and things like that. I would read the comics journal, but basically that's how I was teaching myself uh, how to do this stuff would be to sit there and just work in my sketchbook and practice. Um, and there's also a difference between practicing for uh, practicing to make something beautiful and practicing something to, it's almost like going to the gym. Like there's exercises you do in the gym just to build your muscle. And so this is the same thing. A lot of the stuff I would do in this book, um, I was doing specifically to learn how to build muscle, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So here's, here's, here's another early, again, you know, all, all brush. Hmm. Wow. Is it, are you doing like a stippling technique there or is that cross hatching? That's cross hatching with mm -hmm. a brush. Yeah. And here's another. And that's a, and that's a lot harder than people think trying to another, hatch with a brush. Another old Hulk. Oh, wow. So vascular. <laughs> And that's all brush. Yeah. Right. That's mm -hmm. all brush. So, Mike, around this time, well, wait a minute. This is you said the eighties, so you were already a pro. Um, maybe when you were younger, younger, Mike. Um, how big of an impediment was getting good tools or, or art supplies? I was, it was easy. I wish I could go in a time machine back. Um, again, here's another. Mm. comic very influenced by Mobius is always yeah. like trying yeah. to draw it without yeah. penciling anything you know just mm -hmm. like draw it in ink you know yeah which is uh really makes you think about what you do mm -hmm. um and then i um i never had trouble getting art supplies because they were everywhere everybody you i mean there was illustration was still going you could go to any five and dime and you could find good ink right and i'm sure there i'm sure there were i'm sure there were drafting supply stores around you too because that was a that was a thing back then yeah i used to go and i lived in ann arbor so we would go to utrecht mm -hmm. which was uh downtown yeah they got bought out about 10 years ago by dick blick yeah so I used to go to Utrecht was a place that I went and there was a place, an art supply place in Arborland that I would go to. Um, I mean, there were a bunch of places around town that you could go and you could get even like Kmart and places like that would sell, mm -hmm. you know, some pen and ink, mm -hmm. you know. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Like the old speedball set. Yeah. So, right. you know, I was never a problem finding art supplies and, um, so yeah, I mean, and markers were not very good then. No. <laughs> so if you ink with markers like Toth and um, Gil Kane, well, especially Gil Kane, a lot of his stuff just disappears. It just they're not permanent, and so they start turning red, and then they yeah. start fading, and then eventually it's like lights saw, out. Yeah. In fact, I saw a piece when it was last year somebody had bought of Gil Kane and it was a nice, very nice. I think it was a green lantern piece, mm -hmm. but it had so faded. You could barely see it. And this person was trying to think, trying to see if they could find somebody who would like trace it up, would basically re ink it, mm -hmm. you know, basically re ink it. That's crazy. But you know, and that's mm. like, I know one of the things that we both said to young students is to make sure you're, getting good art supplies or at least the best you can afford at the moment and to consider what you're drawing with like if you're drawing with things that aren't permanent uh or you know something like a permanent marker like a sharpie is not made to last for what you're trying to do no i, I mean i always tell people that a sharpie is for writing living room on a box. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, because I would get, I would do that. I mean, that's one of the things as a teacher is that you see people come in, they don't know, you know, somebody yeah, went to the know. staples and they bought them, 
a bunch of stuff and they're uh, you know very often i'd had a young cartoonist i would meet and they're doing their stuff with a sharpie and you try to tell them like oh no you can't you shouldn't use that because you know in five years your artwork's gonna get weird and fade or spread or yeah what what yeah so yeah many yeah. many a young art cartoonist budding cartoonist have i taken down to the art supply store and like saying like no this is what you buy you get this stuff or you get this stuff mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so yeah no i'm not i'm not marker shaming because actually one of the guys i whose work i really love is Jamar very Nichols. popular <laughs> <laughs> uh, besides jamar nicholas jamar nicholas uh, um bruce bruce tim uses markers he's yeah. almost all markers mm-hmm you know, I remember I was really shocked because when I got to know him and I was looking at his work, I thought, oh, this guy is, you know, he's like traditional tools. But it's like, no, he he was always markers and he never used like dip pens and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. um, I noticed one of the benefits of Inktober in the last several years is that a lot of the young students were actually interested to learn how to use dip pens you know mm -hmm. which i i think are far superior to any marker now again if you know what if you have command of your skill set and your tool you can use any tool and you will you'll make it work but you know there is something that you can only get from a good quality nib dip pen on a really nice piece of paper that a marker is just not it's just not gonna give me that same effect and you know to that point mike it's interesting especially as we move further away from traditional tools or mark making where more people are just learning younger how to use a tablet or how to use your finger on a on a on a glass surface or how to get a really good apple pencil and charge it and then you you know what i'm saying the further we get away from traditional tools, I think it's going to be more and more, um, at least for the preserving the art form, that people know these things exist and how to use them. Um, I have a couple of questions from the room, and then we should get started, Mike. Our, okay. our best mon ami, our best, <laughs> mon, mon, our best mon frere, Christophe, how are you, my friend? Says, could you give us a supply list for a basic setup? Uh, well, I would say that depends upon what you're trying to do. I would say if you're trying to do realistic work, you need to have finer tools. Like you need to have a good fine line, uh, pen. Yeah. Uh, and probably the standard is like a number four brush. Uh, I like, uh, the high carb ink by, uh, Dr. Martins. Mm -hmm. I did get the new Pelican ink. And I have been using that. It's mm. still not as good as the old ink. Yeah. Um, but I would say that. And then, you know, buy some pen points. And you really have to just experiment to find out what works for you. Because what works for me didn't work for Bruce Tim. Right. 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 And what worked for Al Williamson doesn't work for Terry Austin. Right. Or what works for Scott Williams, you know, may not work for Bill Watterson. You know what I mean? And it's like cartoony people tend to use brushes more. But now you have the markers that are flexible enough to give you that line like a brush. Yeah. You know, we were ordering those uh, pens from Jet Pens. Um, I was just on Jet Pens today, Mike. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that's the basic setup. A good quality number three or four sable brush, an assortment of different types of pens, and then you just sort of figure out what you want to do. Now, I know a lot of young people are afraid to use that, and they just like to use markers. And so, you know, I don't think the uh, I don't think the Pigma markers are as good as they used to be. No. You always want to make sure that it's no matter what that it's light fast and that it's waterproof. Um, because if not, your work is basically going to disappear. What about, uh, you know, our best friend, Eternity Forever, 
asks, what about paper? If the markers and in ink fades and bleeds, what what types of paper is staying power? Uh, most paper, well, you want acid free. Mm -hmm. Now, most commercial papers that you buy for doing comics, like the the uh, the uh, uh, Strathmore, like I use Strathmore, uh, what is it? Strathmore three hundred series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now there are manga papers that you buy that are thinner and tougher. Right. They take yeah. the pen really well, mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think that there's one answer for everyone. The only overall answer I would say is that you want something that is not going to hinder your performance or cause you a problem. Like you don't want paper that bleeds. You can use a marker even on paper that bleeds. Mm -hmm. And you know sometimes a pen will tear the surface a little bit. So mm -hmm. you want a really good like minimum 300, mm -hmm. 400, or 500. Although I have to say I have some old paper. This mad old, thick. It's like <laughs> that, that old Marvel and DC paper mm -hmm. that is a thousand times better than any paper you can find on the market today because they just don't make anything the way they they used to because all of these companies keep being bought and sold and then they change where they make it and they change how they make it. Yeah, you know. Um, and I still use a Strathmore, but it's not as good as a Strathmore that I used to buy in the in the eighties and the nineties. Um, so, you know, and I found. Remember, Mike, when when uh, I was really heavy on that Canson fanboy paper <laughs> that that board, and I know it was garbage, but I just liked it. You know what I mean? And I mean that's it. It did what I needed it to do. So. Um, oh, also, I don't know if you've ever used this. Have you ever used a Borden and Riley brand paper? I don't think so. I know Blevins just bought some paper. It's really we, nice. It's real. We, yeah. It's like usually cold press and it's really smooth and it takes lines really well. But it's kind of on the thinner side. But, you know, it's kinda... right. Right. So like I'm uh, like I said, my default is whatever I use, I don't want it to create a problem. I don't want to use the paper. That if I like a pen, bleeds, right? Mm -hmm. Or I don't want a paper that is not acid free because then it will deteriorate over time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the only way you can actually find any of this stuff out is to actually practice, right? Is to to buy buy a pad of this, buy a pad of that, buy a bunch of these markers, buy a bunch of those, buy a bunch of this pen. You know, try this brush, try that brush. Eventually, what will happen is you will find, ah, this is the one that I, this is the one that works for me. Mm -hmm. Right. I like to be sort of a chameleon in a way. So what I would try to do is I would try to figure out, well, what did Al use? Or what did Woody use? Or what did Sinnott use? Or what did, you know, the people that I admired? And I would try to figure out, this kind of pen gives a certain kind of character to the line that I like. So I want to use that pen, right? Uh, uh, Mike, our good buddy, Matt Waringo. What's up, Matt? It's good seeing you a couple week, weekends ago. What does Terry Austin use, Mike Manley? I can't figure it out for looking at his work to save my life. Terry, in the beginning, used to use a lot of repair drafts, but then eventually he started using the Hunt 102. No, it sort of became like the industry standard because a lot of people liked like Terry is one of the most important inkers in comics because he really straddles the 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 bronze age right and then sort of the modern age because he apprenticed was assistants to people like you know Neil Adams and Dick Giordano like old school guys but then he started inking guys like John Byrne, and there was a whole bunch of people that worked with Neil Adams, and those guys came up inking like Klaus Jansen, you know, um, a lot of those guys, you know, Bob Wyatchek, uh, Bob McLeod. Um, there was a lot of people that came up and they apprenticed with somebody, and then they would sort of like learn to use the tools that that person 
did. So yeah, Terry always used the uh, Hunt 102. And what he would do is he would also just gently take a, he would take a piece of very light sandpaper and he would just kind of rub the end, rub the tip very lightly just to take the sharpness off of it so it wouldn't rip the paper. Wasn't there another hack? Sorry, I moved away from the mic. Wasn't there an another hack with nibs? And I don't know if this still works or it's necessary that you had to take a, 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 a flame to the edge of the nibs yeah, to there, kind well, of burn, burn the oil off of them or something. Right. Now there's machine oil from mm -hmm. it being made. Uh, who was somebody you spit? <laughs> somebody, somebody used soap and water. Uh, you know, but it wasn't, you didn't just kind of come from Utrecht and just put it in your chamber and start working. I'm you had, sure to, you had probably, to prep it. I'm sure there were probably times that I did. Yeah. Like I heard that Wally Wood used to take a match and burn the point off of his, one of his brushes because he mm -hmm. would use that for like the, doing the contours and the ruling. Yeah. Some guys would rule with a brush. Some people right. rule with a pen. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, one of the things about craftsmanship of every cartoonist is finding out what works with you what do you like and and you can really only do that by doing like i used to as i showed on those ex examples i would sit there and try to ink something all with a brush ink something all with a pen uh ink something with a different kind of pen um and then i would find out oh this tool does this or this tool does that if i want this feeling or i want this look i can use this tool if i want this feeling or i want this look i can use that tool and the reality is also that no matter what you like in five years you probably won't be able to find it anymore or it will probably be changed in quality because the company that makes it will have been bought by somebody else and you know that has happened so many times in my career i can't i cannot tell you how many times that has happened so i mean i remember when the pigma came out everybody's like oh my god these things are great these things are fantastic um art adams uses them he just buys them by the truckload yeah the microns yeah yeah the microns but they they're to me they're not as good as they were mm -hmm. 10 years ago they don't have as much ink either it doesn't no. i was a big fan of the uh faber castell pit pins for a while and i think yep. they're they're even losing their their snap yeah i still i still have a a ton of them and i was using those mm -hmm. on the phantom sometimes and on judge parker but then i switch to the copic multi-liner where yeah. you can get the replaceable yeah the the the, the yeah the, the, yeah, the yeah. tips yeah if you ask the manufacturer they always say no we're we're doing everything exactly the same <laughs> but yeah and uh, like the copic multi-liners are really decent and the the prices are up there but it's like you, you're really paying for a good product um and you know, sometimes you roll your roll the dice when you go into Michael's Arts and Crafts trying to find some good cartooning supplies in that pin section. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they. I haven't been in a Michael's in probably like two years, so I don't know what they have. Mm -hmm. Not much. <laughs> so, Mike, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, we, Mike, and I were trying to draw straws here, figure out how we're going to do this. So, um, Mike, you have you have your Hulk thing, and I have some stuff on my board. So, once you get started, we'll kind of figure this out. Well, why don't you get started, and I'll go over and I'll get set up, and then I'll let you know when I'm ready. Okay. All right, because right. I gotta I gotta switch my yeah station. yeah. All right, so I'm gonna change my cameras, guys. And I'm going to leave this camera off. Well, hello. Welcome to my hands. So um, I have one of my old big sketchbooks here that I've been using lately to do uh, sketch art and preliminary art for my Leon books lately. Um, 
but I wanted to just do some inking in front of everybody. Uh, right here, I have a couple of old pages of Leon from my first self-published book, Protector of the Playground, um, where you know we've been talking about uh, supplies. And uh, I did this job on uh, Strathmore Bristol pads. Um, I can't remember. Well, you know what? There was a point where I was just using whatever I had. Oh, yeah. This is that canceled paper that we're talking about. Um, what I wound up doing at the time was because I didn't like the actual blue line set up for this. And I also had a bunch of old cover sheets that I was just using the cover pages and flipping them over and drawing on these. So a lot of what I was using at the time for this job was, um, I believe, Kuratake brush pens which is if you've seen me talk about these before these are the i call them the the, the green boys um which has a fiber tip and also has an interchangeable chamber that you can take out come on you see this one's bone dry now and jet pin sells these and they're really cool um you'll after a while even if you're changing the cartridge in there the nib starts to wear down and I never throw anything away. So you might have the freshness of a brand new uh, marker you pulled out the pack and then you have some old beat up ones that give you a broader, flatter line. So um, I did a lot of work with those on this. And then uh, sometimes if I was doing something with a, a finer line, I may use, I enjoyed these, the um, Prismacolor line line markers these are kind of new mike i don't know if you've seen these lately i don't know if you can see that really well uh so they're kind of in the, you know in the micron uh tech pin world but they leave a pretty good line um, and also this was what i'm using i was using and i don't think i have any of those in front of me one of my old hacks was that we would take niji water brushes and fill those with ink. I just happen to have a silver one here that I'm not going to use, but this is kind of what they look like. They kind of have like a a bulb in the in the bottom of them, and you can open this chamber up and usually use it for watercolor, like travel watercolor. You put water in here for your page. But my hack is you'd fill that with ink, usually like rapidograph ink, which was which was thin enough that it would flow really well. Um, so here's another page of that. Um, hold on. <laughs> Mike disappeared altogether. So usually I'm producing, so I got a, I'm doing the arms of Vishnu over here. So let me try to see what's going on. Yeah, I know my wires in the shot eternity. Thank you. <laughs> um, Uh, I'm probably not going to move that because everything's going to fall apart. So we're, we're live, folks. So until Mike gets back and switches over, um, I'm just going to start inking some stuff. All right, let me see if I can try to move that up a little bit. How's that? All right, it's a little bit. Of... So while Mike was talking, I started <laughs> picking with doing like an old Detective Boogaloo drawing if you guys are familiar with my guy here. So what I have here, and I'm a little different from Mike. I'm kind of a whatever's in front of me <laughs> type of cartoonist. So I just happen to have one of these old uh, Sanford Uniball pins, uh, which are good for really thin lines. And uh, I'll probably do like really small detail work with that. And then especially with my Detective Boogaloo stuff, um, I was trying to evoke the spirit of graffiti with Detective Boogaloo, so he'd usually have a really thick outline. So I would try, I would usually do like a thick and a thin marker or a pen or brush. So um, let me see. I'm going to see if this... Sorry about my angle. I'm trying to keep that wire from jumping out. And if you guys have questions while we're doing this, I'll do my best to answer them. And since I'm working in my sketchbook, I'm not gonna turn the page too much. Like 
I'm on a wing of a prayer here tonight. All right, that's will be the marker that's dying. Let's see what else I have over here. I think Mike's computer blew up. Hmm. And, you know, we all have our different styles. Um, and, but a big part of this lesson tonight was supposed to be about digital versus traditional. And... You know, one thing that I can say while I'm just kind of talking, while I'm drawing, is that if there's time saved by doing traditional work, it's probably in the cleanup or kind of toggling between tasks. Um, as I know when I'm drawing on a deadline and I'm doing things traditionally, I'm thinking about how many marks am I going to have to erase or clean up after before I scan this and then you know the scans look good and how's that going and rather than when I'm doing digital I can just it's already there right I'm already halfway finished just by not having to do the importing process and the scanning process and all of that And I'm, I'm a pretty fast inker, and it may be a little different because I'm usually just inking my own stuff, so I don't worry about it so much. If I was inking somebody else, like on the weird occasions that I've inked Mike, you know, you kind of like overthink it or you look at things too much or you're worried about the bottom line way more than you should you would with your own work so when i'm doing my own stuff i kind of am a lot more liberal with it and free with it let me know if you guys can't see what i'm doing or if i have to move in a little bit <clears throat> And I'm a big proponent of kind of what I call drawing down. If you're a football fan and they say things like running backs run downhill, um, I do a lot of pulling in my, in my inking. So thanks, Miguel. I'm usually drawing down the page um, and trying to vary my line weight trying to do thick and thins where it makes sense. But also, one of my editors at Scholastic says that my drawing is very lyrical, and I, I do a lot of riffing, I guess, <laughs> is what they said in my art. So it's kind of like I'm not thinking a super light, a super lot about what the marks I'm making is just, you know, how does it feel at that moment? Am I following the right pattern of the energy I'm trying to evoke in something? <clears throat> Eternity says, do you think about light source before or while you're inking? Um, you know, if anything, I'm thinking more about is this, is this going to get colored, right? If you've ever heard people say I'm inking for color where they would probably not do, oh, here comes Mike, uh, as much spot blacks and things like that. Um, so really a lot more of my stuff is thinking about what's going to happen next. Is this just going to be done when it's done? Do I have to turn this over to a colorist? And then do they have to interpret what I'm doing and have to make adjustments? Hey, Mike, I see you. Uh, let me, I'll bring you on in a second. Sue says, do you draw down the page to keep your hand out of the ink? Um, 
huh, that's a good question. Uh, probably it's more gravity and kind of like drawing up. Like um, I would probably do that more if I was using, you know, traditional brush and things like that. But I'd probably still pull down. Uh, that's something I never really thought about. Um, it's just more like a, the, the natural rhythm for me. And it just kind of works for me. Um, I, where'd that finny guy go? Here it is. So when I'm doing these little kind of the insides of Boogaloo's fur on his jacket, I would just change to a different pin. And, you know, we talk about techniques a lot. I know Mike and some other people may just do everything with a thin line and then go back with a brush and pop out certain areas to add to the line weight. And usually I kind of look at things, I think about the outline and then I'll go back in if I have to and make things thicker. But I usually try to just do things once. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Thank you all. Um, all right, I'm going to tag out. We'll go to Mike. All right, Mike, you're here. How are I'm you? I'm here. Can everybody see me? So um, Yeah, I'll give you the screen, and then maybe we'll do a little side-by-side, -side and I'll try to go along with the uh, questions in the room. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, so I have a um, an old Lang nickel. Um, Kalinsky brush, sable hair. Uh, this is at a number three. It's, it's so old and dirty. It's hard to. So just to show, I'm going to do this Hulk, and then I scanned it in, and uh, I can do a digital. But um, so uh, and I'm using this new. Oh, I should show it. Time for sponsorship. <laughs> I'm using this uh, nice. Pelican ink. So now you get the um, uh, supposedly this is supposed to be like what the old Pelican ink was like, but I'm not sure if that is true oh, the, or back, not. The, the back in the day Pelican, right? Right, right. So mm -hmm. um, when you're inking a drawing, was it Susan? I saw just asked, do you do you start at the top and go to the bottom? Uh, usually, yeah, I would start at the top. And um, again, one of the things I like about working uh, traditionally is that I get to spin the sheet of paper around. Yeah. Right. Now this is a nice brush. Because it gives me the opportunity to do a fat, then in a fat, and then again feathering away gives me a certain type of line. Uh, you go from thin, and then you kind of pull away. So, um. I can get a very thin line, and then I can get a very fat line. And I always enjoy the inking part of a drawing the most because I sort of figure like once I've inked something I uh, once I've penciled something I should say the inking is the is the fun part right the drawing is the hard part and so this is a sort of a very Kirby kind of Hulk because I think Kirby did the best Hulk.
So, Mike, I'll ask you questions because, you know, I enjoy the layman questions. Why are people afraid of brushes? Because it takes longer to master a brush than it does to master a pen in general for most people. Mm -hmm. When you put it down, you don't like, oh, how much, how hard am I pressing, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I would say, you, as you saw in the beginning of the podcast, I mean, I spent years practicing. So I can get a very light, thin, delicate line, or I can get a big, fat, bold line out of the same tool. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, I can't do that with a pen. The right. pen would would explode if I push down on it like so. Right. The pen. Uh, so the brush is the most flexible tool you can have. And if you master it, there really isn't anything that you can't do. So what is more intimidating to the young enthusiast, a brush or the pen? In my experience... Like the nib, you know. Yeah, in my experience, it's always the brush, you mm -hmm. know. But again, you know, it's like you can't, you can't get anywhere if you're afraid. So you just have to sort of like, you have to be willing to make that mistake. You know, you have to be willing to, to, you know, mistakes are how we learn. So if you say, well, I don't want to ever make a mistake, then you're sort of saying, I don't ever want to learn. I mean, gosh, I've ruined many drawings and I had to go back with white out, things like that. Um, and the, you just, there's just, there's just no way around it. You just cannot escape, um, making mistakes in fact i was it somebody i made a, a reply to i think uh Lar christine larson the other day and somebody made something about mistakes and i remember when i interviewed mobius this is back in the early 2000s and he said Somebody asked him about that, about making mistakes. And he said, what do you do when you make making mistakes? And he goes, I call that style. So, <laughs> yeah. so there you go. You got it from the, the master. The master himself. So, yeah, I would say most people find it difficult to use the, the brush. Like, like I said, Bruce, Bruce was talking about, you know, he had a hard time using a brush. He never really learned how to, to use a brush. Now, I mean, the guy is super talented. So I'm sure if he wanted to, he could learn how to use a brush. Right. So to me, it's about it. My whole career has always been about what it is that I want to do. The kind of drawing, the kind of painting, the kind of comics, the kind of image. It's always been about what it is that I want to do. You know, and all the people that I admired, and Jamar, Nicholas. Like Jamar Nicholas could do anything. <laughs> he was amazing, Jamar Nicholas. Jamar Nicholas, much better than cats. I'd watch it again and again. Uh, there's some questions, Michael. There, everybody's ensorcelled by your brushy. Oh, let me see. I got it. I, I got you. I got you. Don't worry about it. Mujin Glider 82. I know who that is. My, it says, Mike, do you ever have an issue with ink drying onto a brush as you're working with it? Mm, no. I mean, if it dries, you just, you should always have a little glass of water, jar of water next to you. I don't tonight just because I'm, I'm just doing this. But yeah, in general, if I'm doing a lot of inking, I always have a little glass of water. And if it starts to look bad or get, you know, sometimes I like when uh, the brush gets a little dry. You can get a kind of a line. Mm -hmm. 
And again, one of the things I'm very, I'm very, uh, I really am paying attention to here is how wet the brush is. And I know by practice and observation how long I will go before I have to recharge the brush. Now, of course, you can use these kinds of brushes. Uh, this is a Pentel. And you can fill it. So you basically never run out of ink until you literally, you know, you use the whole. Oh, yeah. Whole I was just talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it does not have as good a, as good a hair or tip as this brush. Mm -hmm. So, again, these are all choices. These are things that are important to me. They may not be important to you. Right, right, right. right? You know, like a lot of artists don't are not they don't really care what they use they just need to make the mark and anything that makes it a mark is good enough for them mm -hmm. um but i've always been a you know a, a a junkie for and very careful about the two kind of tools that i use um and very picky about the tools that i use like I wouldn't want to do a really beautiful drawing that I really loved, and then ten years from now it disappears. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, our buddy JRD asks, Mike, do you feel the Kiritake brush pens, the nice ones that have the fountain pen bodies with sable brush bristles, are still pens or are they actually like brushes? Uh, I don't. I don't know. You know those those like black ones that come in the wood box. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know because I don't. I don't use. I don't use them. So I can't. I can't say because I don't have that. I don't have a feeling. You know, based upon ex, ex, experience. And see, like my feeling is that the only way to know that is to get one and to ink with it. Right, do a do a a bunch of drawings with it, you know. Do a do a comic with it, and then go. Okay, yeah, I like that. Or, nah, I still prefer my Pigma or whatever. I mean, it's so individual, right? It it is so individual when you're doing this stuff. It's really hard to speak for just like, oh. All this stuff works for me, right. but it just may not. You know, again, it just you know, there's some people that are all pen. They ink everything pen. You know, they would fill their blacks with a pen. You know, that's just like that's the way they 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 work. That's the weird thing about comics, right? There is no or art, right? There's mm -hmm. no one answer for everyone you know mm -hmm. my main thing was i was always trying to emulate very specific artists right so one of the things i do prefer about traditional my eye the height of my head to my paper allows me to see the entire image at one time the entire time that I'm working on it. If I'm working it digitally, if I zoom out on my on my uh, my iPad, I mean on my iPad, my my uh, <laughs> antique, as you will see, I'm I'm not almost never looking at the entire image as a whole at one time. So I'm gauging these line weights that I'm putting on as I'm doing it in relationship to the whole thing. But often, if you're working on the Cintiq or digital tablet, you're in like that. You're, in, you're, you're, this is where you are. You're very rarely out. So, the whole process of me inking this, I see the whole image at the same time. To me, that is very important. Hmm. And a lot of what I'm able to do, uh, 
is based upon digitally is all I have to say, correct it. Everything that I do digitally is based upon my years of experience doing this stuff this way. Right. Right. Like how I feel this, my hand, right. I can tell how much humidity in is in the air by how my hand feels on the paper. Right. And if it's a really humid day in the summer, I might have to turn up my air conditioner so that the paper doesn't get too wet. Right. So again, that might not matter to somebody else. You're like, I don't care. I sure. ink this with a tooth. Oh, I'll ink this with a toothbrush. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't care what 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 happens to the art. Right. What I will say that I do notice from teaching a lot of young people who use digital tools because the industry demands that you use them is that there is no command Z here. If I screw this up, Just I screw it up. That's screwed up, right? Then I got to use whiteout or, you know, take it into Photoshop and, you know, try to fix it. That is something that there's a braveness and a confidence that comes from the traditional tools that I don't feel that you may ever quite get working digitally because you always have the option to like flip it around command Z a hundred times. I mean, it's something that I became, I guess, probably really aware of teaching all these younger artists because they would sit there and go like they would make a line i don't like it command z make a line command z make a line command z yeah command they would make like 40 times they would be making a line and I've, seen I, a lot, I've seen a lot of web cartoonists get caught in that trap too yeah yeah i mean you're sitting there you're making a line you're making a line you're making a line there's like a i don't know there's a certain amount of craftsmanship it comes out of that. Yeah. And then I usually have a little piece of, of here I have a just a piece of toilet paper that I use to take extra ink off. Now, if you see one of the things I'm not doing is I'm not, also, I'm also not loading up the brush. You see the, the, the ferrule of the brush this whole thing is not full of ink. And a lot of times people make a mistake of, so you dip it in. If you got too much, you take a little out, then you got a nice point. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of little things that you learn craftsmanship that will become kind of like unique to you. Mm -hmm. um, which I, you know, I think that that's, endlessly fascinating so like here i'm pulling a line as opposed to pushing because i'm trying to get these little lines so do any of you cats and kittens have any more questions for us while we're doing this they're totally bored now this is boring JRD Hold says, something up. <laughs> put, 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 tell Alexa to play something. Digital only drawing seems to breed a perfection stigma in the younger artists. Small flaws in their work doesn't become character in the work. It's just wrong. So, right. So the, the act of trying to get the perfect eyeball, command Z, command Z, command Z, command Z, command Z. Um, that's kind of like, I don't know. It's... I think that's kind of like a newer problem. Well, it's also, I think part of it is, again, is that you're not seeing the whole. You're seeing like this little face and then you blow it up and you're like, oh, I don't like the fact that those lines don't look, right. you know, perfect. Right. I mean, I think a great, way to learn technique is to really 
practice working in somebody else's style. Like try to ink something like um, Kevin Allen. Then try to ink something like, you know, Joe Sinnott. Or then try to ink something like Milton Kniff or Frank Robbins. You know, you really mm -hmm. learn a lot about the techniques and the calligraphy of things when you work with, you work, you can work in another person's style, which is something that happens in, com, in, car, in animation all the time because we're all working in, you know, the style of the show. In comics, it's much more individual. Mm -hmm. uh, our good buddy, Deep Brad. What up, Deep Brad? Deep Brad says, do you have a rule for what line should be thick versus thin? Um, I think that all has to do, like the whole idea of line weight has to do with gravity. It has to do with your light source. And, and also just trying to make your characters have some life or your drawing have some life. Um, Mike, do you have an answer for that? Well, there's different sort of schools for inking. If you're doing like Bugs Bunny or you're doing um, animation, you tend to... If you're doing something that's animated, you're tending to do something with a line that's thin, thick, thin, thin, thick, thin, thin, thick, thin. And in fact, doing practicing, doing this allows you to know when to pull a line, when to push a line. If you're doing, if I if I do a, and I make this line here very heavy, it tends to look like it's weighted on the bottom, right? If you make so, if you make a, let's say you you do like Popeye's knee. But I make the bottom thicker. Right? That indicates line weight. Right? But you also might have something if you had a face. Eyes without a face, face, face. All right. Now, if I put a line behind her, let's say I was doing, say I was going to add curtains. I would want those lines to be thinner. Right? I would want those lines to be thinner. If I make those lines just as thick as the face kills the space. So in inking, you get indication of distance by thickness of line weight, right? That looks like it's going far further away, but it's just inking the line thinner. So in general, foreground figures have bolder line weight some of it also came out of stuff being reproduced in newspapers and so you wanted to have a bolder line on the figures that's sort of like cartooning standard yeah. although there are people who had like the french or the belgian like uh herge mm. tin pin tonton tonton they would have a very thin line. Yeah. Um, so, again, you know, you can look at somebody like um, Roy Crane, who was a fantastic cartoonist, very much in the same era 
very much sort of the same feel as that stuff, but you know, he doesn't do quite the thin, thin line. You know, stuff being reproduced in newsprint tended to make people be a little bit bolder. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, JRD asks, well, it's more like a statement question. So thinner line weight is akin to a lighter color as darker colors is akin to thicker line weights in the near versus far approach? Uh, no, line weight indicates depth. Light and depth. It has, I don't think of it as color. I just think of it as, as light or shadow, close or far. You know, um, there are people that break those rules. Um, guys like, say, Stan Drake was one of the great classic comic strip guys. Did a very realistic strip called The Heart of Julia Jones. Huge influence on people like Neil Adams. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I first saw Stan Drake, I thought, oh, where did Neil Adams do this strip? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, he would do these big, fat outlines, contour lines. He was mostly a pen guy, but then he would go back with a brush and pop these contours. And you would think, wow, that line is really fat. But of course, you realize everything is reduced. It's in the newspaper. And it really helped pull and separate the figures from the background without destroying that sense of space. So, Michael, um, Mujin Glider82 asks, can you guys please talk more about learning to accept those happy accidents when it comes to your work? Building confidence in your brush strokes and leaving behind the pursuit of perfectionism. Uh, I don't know. I'm always pursuing perfectionism. If I was pursuing a happy accident, like let's say I wanted to work in a way that was very, like here I'm trying to be perfect. I'm trying to make these perfect, you know, lines. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to make an accident. But let's say I was doing something like, you know, like somebody like Bill Sienkiewicz employs a lot of mm -hmm. techniques that are random and are very, uh, he won't be able to predict how it looks. Right? right. Again, that's a conscious decision to do something that is not going to be um, perfection, you know, which he got from looking at many of the artists that uh, influenced him. So to me, it's always a choice. It's a choice to be spontaneous, just as it is a choice to be, uh, you know, very, you know, neat and controlled. At least for me. Um, I got a different answer. Um. You know, I, I love the idea of perfectionism, but I don't think that's something that I'm actively chasing in my work. You know, I do want every drawing I do to be better than the last one, but, you know, I don't necessarily call that perfection. You know, other people might have a different term for that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think most... It's like craftsmanship, I think. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I don't, I don't, you know, if I think of all the people that I know well, like Jamar or, uh, you know, Blevins or people that I worked with, like uh, Williamson or Villagran, they don't sit there and go like perfection. The whole, I think, the the thing is, is that you you want to try to get to that point with your skill set that no matter what you do, you're achieving the feel that you want with your art. If part of that embraces randomness or risk with, you know, mark making or mm -hmm. technique, I think that's, you know, that's fine. But I, I don't, I, I think that's, that's something that most 
people I know don't really think about when they're working. Yeah. I think I grabbed every dry pen that I own <laughs> to put on the table here. Yeah, I just <laughs> recently went through and trashed some pens. Oh my god, I must have yeah. trashed 90 pens. Yeah. You know. That's the other thing is they is that pens don't last long. So no, not at all. If you buy a box, you really got to use them up quick because yeah. in three or four months, they'll be dead. Yeah, you can't really stockpile them like the way you want to. I mean, I'll, I'll say that I went to an art supply purge. I had so I have kind of like a medicine chest of each drawer is just pens or um, technical pencils or markers. You know, a lot of people know I'm a, I'm a mark, I'm like coloring with markers. And there's so many old markers that I had to just get rid of. And even the crusty critic, Mike Manley, who never throws away an art supply, there's a point where it's just like, I can't do anything with this dead marker. You know, you know the, the thing is, is that you can bring back a marker. I think we talked about that before. Yeah, yeah. But then you have to ask yourself, okay, now I'm sitting here today. I'm going to spend six hours refilling <laughs> 90 old magic markers, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, is that an effective use of my time? Did I really save money? Because now I could have drawn, like, I don't know. We could have done a, a bunch of pages in that time. Mm-hmm. Does that is that effective, or do you just toss them in there, recycle and move on? Right. Yeah, I guess there is a point like where maybe it's just worth you getting a new pen. <laughs> I don't. I don't like to fight my art supplies, and yeah. so, and I don't have. I never have enough time to do any of my work. So, for me, if anything is janky it just i toss it i don't i won't fight it for five minutes hmm. you know i i don't i don't want to have to sit there and hassle with a brush or a pen or anything like that so you know and i tend to buy a bunch of art supplies at one time yeah so <coughs> well i hope you guys have been enjoying this episode of boot camp Mike is always bringing the lush artwork. <coughs> you were bringing the lush. What happened to your lush? Your lush went away. S sketch God. Uh, no, it's it's there. I'm trying to find a good a good tool here. Here's something I used to. I remember. I can't remember. Maybe it was one of the times I went to Tokyo and I bought all the stuff back. And then I realized I needed to use it because some of the stuff was starting to go bad. Like, here, I'm going to put it on both of us again. Now I have all this stuff all over my desk. Here's something I found. I remember buying this. Check this out. It's like a... I guess it's a... What do you call it? A... Oh, it's like a what do you call it? A syringe for your for your for your ink or water for your bottle. Ink drugs. Uh oh. He got blasted. So sometimes you gotta take a little bit more care with things like toes. Although the Hulk does not have very delicate toes. BRD just told me that I'm not organized. I don't know, man. It's a violation. You know, my magic comes into chaos. <laughs> uh, you, Mike, you've seen my marker box that I bring to shows, right? That clear case. With all the prismas in it, um, I don't I think so. Yeah, I don't yeah. put them in order. They're just in there. Like I know where they're. Like I've seen your tackle box. Pause. Um, and it's just like a box full of stuff, and you you figure it out. You know what's in there. 
so you know organizing things is not really you know organizing a bunch of markers to be in color order doesn't save me any time that's just the way i rock oh these are nice i can't remember where i bought these but i bought a ton of them i think i got these off of clearance of jet pens they're just a bunch of almost like um flare markers and they it's pretty nice And for all of you, all of you inky people out there, how much do you practice? You know, do you have a piece of bristle that's just covered with lines? You know, or are you constantly trying to work on your control? I mean, I, you saw those examples that I showed you. There were probably hundreds of times that much stuff easily. Yeah. over the years um and i would say by the time i was 16 my inking was actually ahead of my drawing i actually got a really good line by the time i was mm. 16 17 i could do a really nice good controlled line you know it took me longer to become better at penciling mm -hmm. and it's more difficult yeah which is actually one of the reasons why some people go into inking or did uh, because they were like, well, they were had a really good line and they drew well, but it just, they didn't draw fast enough or maybe mm -hmm. they were not good with storytelling or maybe they were not that dynamic, you know? Uh, Deep Red asks if I missed if you're drawing on Bristol or not. I guess he's talking to you, Mike. No, I'm just drawing in a uh, on a, a sketchbook, uh, sketch pad. Yeah, this is a Strathmore sketch. Looks good. It's it's uh, what is it? Is uh, sixty pound. So it's just like the minimum. It's like what I do a sketch on at a show. Mm -hmm. Which is sort of like what this is. This is like a. This is the kind of sketch I would do for somebody at a show. Yeah, you would. Well, Mike, we're running close to two. Do you want to try to do digital or you just want to finish your ink, your ink piece? I'm almost done with this, but I guess I could switch over and do the same thing. Well, do your foot and then... We'll switch over and see how far we get. And while Mike's finishing up, um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free. And Mike, tell, tell uh, the, the Pencilers a little bit about our upcoming YouTube content. Because we've been talking about you doing some more things on the channel. Yeah, I think I'm going to try doing a... Uh like an in-studio uh, podcast where I'm talking at, like this while I'm working. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm going to try doing that. And maybe people will have some more questions or or not. I'm sure we'll get, we'll always get the questions afterwards. That's what's always funny. People always ask you afterwards. They ask you questions. Um, yeah. And I, I, do a similar thing on uh, my Patreon, my uh, Ashy stream, where I kind of draw and talk to whoever shows up. So yeah, you know, I think just for the sake of the channel, I, I can do some drawing on it too. You know, just more content for the channel in between the pencil to pencils and my coffee breaks. Well, yeah, I mean, if if if, if this is something that people are interested in. You know, if not, then we don't have to do these anymore. We can just do the interviews, you know. Yeah, yeah, you guys. Do you like these or not? Sound off. You mean like th they may find this completely boring? I don't know. <laughs> you. This makes my eyes hurt.
What does Cosmo say? He says, it's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> He's trying to walk me. <laughs> so we got a thumbs up from Matt. We got a thumbs up from Deep Red. He says he soaks it in. Love it. <laughs> like it. Yo, what up, James Q? Thank you. Nice seeing you on the channel. Like and subscribe, bro. JRD, I, I put JRD on timeout for his spicy comment. Um, just remember, I'm in control of the boards. What he uh, made a made spicy comment? He he uh, he had a little snarky thing to say about my organizational skills. So you got to pay. Uh, JRD says, "Sorry, I was banned. I love this kind of stuff in many more ways more than the interviews." You hear that, Mike Manley? You could do alternate alternate forever. <laughs> Weeks of drawing at interviews. Eternity says, I like it. Chevy Chase. That's such a great one. And also JRD says, I learn as much from watching as I do from shop talk. Thank you for that input. So there we go. Your nice. Basic, your basic sort of Kirby Hulk. You know, mm -hmm. um, so let me, uh, get my, uh, my, get your, uh, get your act together. Yeah. Here, I'm going to turn my uh, camera off. All right. And I'm still here. And then I'll turn my camera back. My camera. So I'm, um. I'm going to do some shilling. Uh, you can uh, go check out. Mike has a really bustling uh, T Public store. Uh, so you go go check that out. Bustling. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I think they're having another sale. So if you want to support me doing what i love uh doing my wind downs and all that then you know please go to my t public store um hold on a second and you can also check out my patreon <laughs> uh, a good pal of mine, Deep Breath. Isn't that fantastic? Sue says, I'm not an artist and I find these boot camps fascinating. Fascinating. Love it. Mike smashed it. Ugh. <laughs> I love having company while I'm also working in the studio. And yes, I need stickers. Give me your stickers. This is one of my favorite stickers right here. The uh, Brian Lee O'Malley gave me one of these official Scott Pilgrim stickers. Don't get mad. Get Scott Pilgrim. So we're going to try to go digital quickly. Uh, I, I, as producer JN, I try to keep us tight with the time. Sometimes we go over, but this podcast does not need to be three hours long. So uh, we're going to try to see what we can get done with some digital inking. All right. So just stand by. We're doing some technical switching right now. Okay, now I will get my Clip Studio Paint.
Okay. So are you you're gonna switch your camera? Yep. Okay. I'm going to share my screen is what I'm going to do. Yeah, okay. And as we say in the the halls of Pencil to Pencil, where does the time go, Mike Manley? Time keeps on slipping. Slipping into the fuse. So, yeah, guys, while Mike's getting his, his deal together, any other questions? I'm glad to see that there's a lot of um, support for boot camp. Uh, we started off the episode with people kind of saying that boot camp was scary. That's a scary title. Scary, and man. It's so scary. But you know what? Here on P2P, we ain't never scared. But, you know, this is part of it, you know, to talk the talk you gotta walk it too um everybody knows that mike man is a magnificent cartoonist a without, magnificent beast without measure so is this showing up is this you can see it can you see it no you can't see my screen no right. click share screen uh, to throw there's nothing here yet oh here it is it's coming now okay i see your desktop you don't see the oh yeah here it is okay here we go you're good bro you see it okay yes. um, okay so now you see this is what i would see normally this is about the same size as my drawing and i see everything all at one time but if i'm going to start digitally inking and i usually use the g pen and i might start out with like a 30 point, right? Uh, you usually go in a little bit. Now, sometimes what I'll do is I'll lighten it up. I'll lighten up the pencils a little bit because they tend to be a little bit darker for some reason when I scan them in and I ink on a layer. So now I'm, again, I'm, I'm pulling that line, but it's not as, uh, it doesn't snap. You're using, right? the, you're using the, the, the real G pen here. The real G pen, right? So only real G's use real G pen. Well, the, here's the thing. I went and I downloaded all these different brushes, mm -hmm. right? And then after I had them, I would ink. You know, um, the only brushes I've really found, all right, the only brushes I found that really would be different is like this spongy pen. Mm -hmm. So if I make it just point. You see, it gives you that kind of crunchy line. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I would use that for a dry brush. But I really found that the real G-Pen, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, that's what I'm using. So, again, I'm... really relying upon muscle memory because I don't my hand which is sliding over this piece of glass now feels like a piece of glass does not feel like the sheet of paper and the thing is when I make this so if I make a stroke like this and then let's say I make a longer stroke like that right mm -hmm. if when I'm in order for me to get the stroke to the way that I really like it what I would naturally do is I would turn it as I inked. So I would make my stroke, make my stroke, right? I have to turn the canvas, which is still not as organic a process as turning the actual sheet of paper, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, of, so, so basically between me and my drawing, is this web of technology and what i have to try to do is figure out even though like i said i love clip studio paint i think it's a great a great program i still have to figure out a way to make it work as close as i can to how i would be working if i was working traditionally like we just watched so again it's not 
it's not natural, right? It's something that is that is learned. And so I try to sort of think of this in the same way of making these, you know, what is this, 10,000 paper cuts? Uh, hours of practice or whatever to become uh, an expert. expert. Yes. Yeah. So I have way more than 10,000 hours. If I think about all the time that I spent, mm -hmm. say, starting when I was 13, right? That's when I decided I wanted to be a cartoonist. So that was a lot more time. I mean, decade. I started when I was 13, and I got my first job when I was 23 at Marvel or DC. So I can't count the amount of hours that I spent, you know. And so I think my main advice to everybody tonight is just to spend as much time doing this as you can you know it's definitely what you put in you get out without a doubt when it comes to drawing there's like no shortcut or any way of skipping over the thousands of hours that you will spend perfecting your craftsmanship and to me it's like like i love my job you know i love doing this for a living this is exactly what i wanted to do you know so if it took me twenty thousand hours to get to it it would still be that would be fine with me and I have spent far more than that, you know. My average work week is probably 80 hours, mm -hmm. right? And then when I'm not drawing, I'm still usually drawing just for myself because I love drawing. So for me, it's all a, a matter of contributing to me doing for a living what I love to do. Now, I would say the digital is faster. There's no dipping of the pen. There's no like looking to say, oh, is that dry? Oh, sh you know, mm -hmm. crap, I, I smeared it. <laughs> you just ran your arm through it, right? Right, yeah. So it is faster. Uh, and I've been doing it several years now. So I'm even faster than I was when I started. Um, but in my heart of hearts, no matter how good I get at doing this, I'm never going to lo love it as much as working traditional. Now, for other people, that might be, like I said, for other people, that might be completely different. They'd be like, yeah, man, I love the digital. I don't, and I don't care about having an original. And I don't care about, you know, any of that old man stuff that you like that that's not important to me so um your old man jazz you 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 like to have art you like to have physical originals but i mean it's also very obvious that you're not against digital you're not being an an old man yelling at clouds about digital no Right. Or you wouldn't use it at all. And we have colleagues that don't use digital at all. Right. right. Uh, the one thing I will say is that the, the main reason we are using digital, most of us are using digital, is because the industry demands that you work digitally. Right. All these students in school in the last what 15 years, especially had to start learning how to like paint digitally because nobody wanted your original, you know? Yeah. Um, 
you know, Al Williamson worked his whole career. Charles Schultz worked his whole career using traditional tools. They would do weeks of their strips, box them up, send them into the syndicate. The people in the syndicate would do all the production. Now you, as the artist, have to do the production. They don't do the production. You do the production. So there's a lot of things, and they don't pay you anymore for it. It's just like that's just a cost that you have to absorb yourself, you know? Yeah. So, I think you're always going to be able to work traditionally. And I actually think that just even noticing things like Inktober, people have really it will probably, you know, be fads where people are like, oh, I really want to learn how to, you know, do watercolor. Yeah. Not a real watercolor, not digital watercolor. Right. Right. Because when you do real watercolor, it's a totally different experience. Paper, Facts. you know, mm -hmm. the technique, the accidents, that's a medium that has a lot of random things that happen to it and you sort of have to learn to embrace that now one thing i've noticed that you ha you're not doing mike is i don't see you doing any fills like you're not drop uh, you're not yeah. drop you're not dropping fills in there no i mean i could like i could you just hit that area right and i could trap that but i guess what i'm not doing a reason main reason i'm not doing fills because i'm trying to ink this uh traditionally in other words mm -hmm. traditionally you don't fill anything right and so there's all these little gaps right mm -hmm. which now if i if i close all that up where to close all these lines up I would lose some of the spark or the spontaneity, mm -hmm. right? It would kind of make the form dead, right? So, but I can go in and say, okay, for this, this part, I do want to trap that. And I could fill that, you know, with the, with the paint bucket. Ploit, right? I could do mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this, you know, I can. I'm also a little bit warmed up now from having mm -hmm. the other one. So mm -hmm. you kind of, your hand gets warmed up so you can move a little faster, you know. And it's time for a wind down now, Mike. <laughs> I, I probably will do a wind down later. Mm -hmm. I did that one of Batman and Batgirl last night that yeah, everybody that, really liked. That was fun, yeah. Um, so you can see right away, you know, I can move faster. It's, you know, and then I can go back in. And, you know, you can be real perfectionist and go, I want to make that line. Right. Mike, Mike, with your phantom work, no, wait a minute. You do the judge digitally, right? I ink the phantom digitally. You ink the, okay. So let's say with that, do you have a Zoom rule where I know with a lot of digital cartoonists, if you, you have the danger of zooming in so much and noodling, that you kind of lose yourself in the process and waste a lot of time. Do you have like a percentile rule of where you won't zoom in any further? No, I think it's all just because at this point it's all experience and water under the bridge. And I know like what it's going to look like when it's shrunk down and I know what it's going to look like, you know, it's just from experience, you know, um, I, I I do think that the young artist tends to do this. Yeah, to get like super right, so they can go and go in and like, oh well, I don't like the fact that this line. Uh, I gotta go in here, and I, right? Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people doing stuff like that, right? A lot of people <laughs> going in, and they can make this 
you know, so like you could take the, you know, the curve line tool, right? And you could go in and like make that perfect. Yeah, just right? just pop that. Right? You know, mm-hmm. you know, like a lot of people go in and they can make that perfect, right? Um, I, I, my whole thing is I'm always trying to do this, just like I did the traditional thing the main thing that it offers me is speed right it offers me the ability to go faster also partially or mostly based upon the fact that i've been doing this so long that i have the muscle memory is helping me make that stroke right and muscle memory sort of helps me figure out like well what stroke do i want to use right mm-hmm. do i want to do i want to pull this one down right oh there's i have some new tricks mike check this one out <laughs> no we're what oh wait i didn't no you could i just moved our little our little heads oh okay i can't yeah i can't see when i yeah. okay you have steve conley in the building um steve conley for comics, imperfect is more perfect. Yeah, I mean, like we were saying before, I don't think there's any one answer for any of this stuff because some people want their stuff to be perfect. Other people don't want their stuff to be perfect. Mike, so a little further back, and you know, I got to say a shout out. Can you guys hear me? I'm a little far back. Um, a shout out to all of the new faces I'm seeing in the chat. There's a lot of people uh, checking in on Facebook and YouTube that I've never seen on the stream before. Thank you, guys. I want you to like, subscribe, and smash that alarm so you get our signposts, as I call them, for for our next guests. Um, but, uh, Mike, uh, there were a couple of queries about how come you're not using those surface texture um acetate covers on your Cintiq to give you the paper effect? Uh, I guess because I never bought one. <laughs> looks, looks like we're going to have a new sponsor soon. Ha. Huh. Yeah, surface cover paper. Dot net. Dot net wants to. <laughs> I will be a, I will be a, a good. Uh, Hey, we hey, crazy Spoke things have happened. Yeah. But yeah, in general, I try not to zoom in too much because then I, I don't, it kind of like, I'm not getting my, my stroke, you know, I, it's all about having the thing at the right size. From all my years of working traditionally to get the stroke that I want. I love it. This is the power of pencil to pencil, Mike Manley. Mike, while you're finishing that up, I have some broad questions I want to ask you just about how you feel about the podcast. We've been doing this for a while now. How I, hate, it. I hate it. How do you feel your approach to doing these has changed or maybe even do you feel like it's affected your, I don't know. It's maybe just a different way of teaching. Do you feel like you're teaching when we're doing these or you're sharing? 
I feel like I'm sharing. I'm not teaching because I'm not looking at mm-hmm. somebody else's artwork. So I feel like I'm sharing. This is what I want to do, or this is how I like to work. And then other people may feel like, oh, you know, it's different. I think because it's not, it's also not, it's not personal. When I'm teaching somebody, I'm teaching somebody usually in the classroom and, you know, they've made a special time to come in. It's it's more focused. So I sort of feel like, I mean, this, you can learn from what I'm doing, but I, I feel it's more sharing you know, um, which I guess teaching is too, you know, I mean, I suppose teaching really is, is sharing to some degree, you know, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know. How do you feel about that? I think it's, I like edutainment and I like the fact that we can, I feel like it's sharing, right? And I think we've both been in roles over the years of being able to give advice to people in different ways. And also, you know, I think we have a very interesting production. I think we have a very interesting on screen uh, energy and relationship. I think it's I think it's fresh, and I think most of the people that watch us and uh, are regular viewers like like that energy and like that we're not stuffy so and sos. No, oh, I'm right? stuffy. I'm totally stuffy. Well, I was trying to I was trying to cut you, I was trying to cut you a break, Mike, <laughs> you, know? you know. But you know, and, and, but and and also, there's so many people doing things on the internet, and there's a million cartoonists doing something or having a show or something like that. But it's, it ain't pencil to pencil, yo. And I and I'll fight you on the street for that. I think we have a different a different deal than everybody else. I wonder what all, all of our viewers think about that. What makes this special? Yeah, I, I suppose you know you. Can, I I I couldn't know that, nor could you. Only the, only the 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 reader might or the viewer might mm-hmm. be able to think about why that would be. <laughs> Steve Conley, read middle age. Middle age Steve Conley says, "I come here for the stuffiness." <laughs> yes, you know. Jared D says, "Well, I think the show is at its peak with Brett as well." You hear that? Uh, that's a podcast Voltron. I like that the three of you together cover such a wide swath of the industry, so you give amazing perspectives. Thanks, Jared D. Yeah, we might be able to get Brett to come back someday. Oh, Jared D has more to say. JN from Raw Indie Cred Comics. I'm underground, baby. Brett from the more artsy side of mainstream and Mike from the more popular side of mainstream. D. Brett says, you guys seem like you're yourselves and not putting on a fake persona. Oh, I appreciate that. But I like that he says he seems like we're ourselves. <laughs> He's just totally fake. Just not sure. Totally fake. Can't be sure. That's you get the fry squint. Not unsure. This is record time inking. Look at you. You're swinging for the fences. <laughs> We're like crisis actors. <laughs> that thumb is giving me life, bro. J. 
Gerard D says, although Mike's transition in newspaper strips adds an even greater dimension when added to Jan's love of Ketchum and classic strip storytelling. Well, that's good. I'm good for something. Uh, gl glad to hear it. So, Mike, while you're finishing up, I'm going to give a plug for... I want to give people a secret, a secret inside sneak peek at our next guests. So Go ahead. I'd say I, I was uh, very giddy that um, you guys, uh, we have filled our roster all the way up until almost the end of the year. So um, next week, we've got a humdinger. Join us, guys, live next week, Wednesday, 8 p.m. EST, as we welcome... Stranger in Paradise is Terry Moore to the program. Um, very excited about that. And then the week after that, we have one of my favorite Canadian cartoonists, Dave Cooper, is going to be on the show. So come on, bro. You can't lose with that lineup. It's a murderer's row. Very excited. So if you're thinking about you know what you're doing next Wednesday you got a date now the only problem when you do the paint bucket you got to make sure you got all the little holes filled yeah and then sometimes you fill it and like where is a hole I can't find it <laughs> It's looking good, Michael. It's good enough for comic books. <laughs> it's good enough. Look at that. <laughs> Jerry Craft in the building. Yeah, so, Mike, you know, just at your at at the, at first blush, what do you, what would you say the differences are between this digital piece and your sketchbook job? Uh, one is a speed. Two is, uh. It's just a feeling. And again, you know, I'm trying to do this in the way that I would do something traditionally. Um, and uh, so I really, I'm really, re I'm constantly relying upon my um, process as a traditional artist to inform my, you know, my digital uh workflow right um and uh again you know there's if i even if i did this five times better than the traditional piece i always feel like in some way i lose because um i'm not um i'm not gonna have uh my Original, and I always want to have an original, you know. Mm -hmm. I always want to have an original, so so there you can see, you know, I can work faster. Um, I can go back with that piece and tickle up all the edges. And if I didn't like the way I ink the passage, I could erase it and re ink the passage. Um, again, you can't do that with the um traditional piece so with the traditional piece the stakes are higher you have to think a little bit more you can't if you mess something up to fix it you've got to go a lot further than you can do digital so digital wins with that 
if the client comes back and goes like, no, I don't like that face or I don't like this, and, you know, change this thing or yeah, move this yeah. over here or whatever, you know, um, again, that's just my preference. I'm an old school guy. I love old school stuff. I do embrace the the uh, digital. I do like digital stuff, but I prefer having an original at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I have this. Mm -hmm. Right? And I can go sell this and make a million dollars. <laughs> a kaskillion dollars. Or... You know, the thing is, is that we're still so early. What? Digital stuff's been around 30 years. Who's to say what will be in 30 years? Who will say that this Photoshop file will be able to be read by some program in 30 years? Who's to say JPEGs will be able to be read by some program in 50 years? Right? I, can't, I can't read these zip disks that laying around now. Right. And I mean, again... You have to think about that as an artist, right? I let's say you spend your entire career working digitally, and what happens if that particular format goes away? What do you do then? How how do you how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that like oh now all my stuff was on zip disks? And I can't look at a zip disk anymore. Right. Right. Or mm -hmm. I did everything in Photoshop and Photoshop got bought by whoever and they got rid of it. And now Photoshop files don't. I mean, how many people are complaining about Apple now? The fact that they're getting rid of all the USBs. Mm -hmm. You're making you get the USB C and they don't have enough ports in their machine. My right. favorite, my favorite thing is the air. Was it the AirPods? Is that what they call it? The base, the earbuds with no wire. And now they make a wire to go with the AirPods. <laughs> They're just selling you the same thing back to you. It's so funny. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, and in general, I like Apple products. But the fact is, every time you buy something, you get a new cord and a new adapter, mm -hmm. which doesn't work with the old cord and the old adapter, right? So, um, so yeah, so I don't know if anybody else has any uh, other comments. Yes, or, uh, yeah. Uh, D. Brad wants to know, yo, know, how much, Mike? <laughs> uh, you can contact me privately. All right. See, look at that. People making money. I like it. All right, you guys, we're going to start wrapping this up. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out for one of my favorite parts of uh, our campaign boot camp. That's right, boot camp. Um, now everybody's. <sighs> that's right. You know, the private, everybody, private everybody's Benjamin. Had to, like, crawl under the razor wire with machine life, machine gun fire <laughs> above their heads. <laughs> um, thank you guys for joining us as usual. Um, yes. I, this was a fantastic episode. Um, I. I hope everybody's encouraged by the things that you saw here today to go out and keep drawing yourself. If you aren't an artist uh, uh, or a cartoonist of that stripe, I'm sure that you'll find inspiration somehow in our little podcast that we do. So thank you so much for your eyeballs and your support. You practice, can just practice, 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 practice time for timer. Uh, so you'll see me tomorrow night right here on this bat channel for Coffee Break with JN at 9 Will you be inking something? Uh, I'll, be I'll, be, I'll be drinking coffee and running my mouth. But on Ashy Stream, you'll see me drawing. I got an Ashy Stream coming up soon. Um, and Mike, when do you think you're going to – we have some more behind well, the We have to work out the technical – As you, I'm actually surprised that this all paid off tonight because I had to like switch and then switch and then – we made it work. We made it work. We um, made it work. We always make it work, yeah, brother. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a weekly work cast where I'm broadcasting while I'm working. Maybe I can sort of show some of the process of what I'm working on. Maybe it might be a wind down or it might be uh, some of the comic strips or, you know, um, you know, somebody might ask a question. I might draw an answer. Mm, look at that. And maybe I'll show up, Mike. 
<laughs> you can show up. Okay. All right. Oh, you know, I want to see you at a coffee break. Let's, I want to see that. I try to, you know, I try to give you your space, man. I mean, I figure like, <laughs> you need, you need, you, you know, you got enough of me in this. You know, you need to have your own. Uh, oh, I need my own know, vehicle. Is that? You need your own vehicle. You don't need me <laughs> showing up and like, hey, I'm over here. Hey guys, it's Mike Bailey. Uh, show up and be your Andy Richter. You just show up at the top top of the treehouse. Hey guys, what are you doing? Eating apple jacks. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to go home. Guys, yep. we had a, had a great time for my uh, Best What Mike Manley. I'm Jamar Nicholas. You know what to do now, guys. Pull them out. Wash those curvy hands. Oh, Hulk nice. hands. Hulk hands. Watch the, the Hulk. Hulk hands. <laughs> I love Bye, it. everybody. Bye.